Man, how beautiful and how awesome is just the Lord's presence. If, uh, if you're new here this morning, my name is Adam, and we just want to welcome you here today. I want to be honest with you, man, I've been praying for you this entire week. And I just believe if you just open your heart to the Lord today, that the Lord wants to do something special in your life. That today is a day that I believe none of us are here by mistake. And what the Lord wants from you more than anything else is just a real, authentic relationship with him. He is pursuing you with reckless abandon. And he is everything to us, your journey. We are a passionate group of people. We are passionate about the presence of God. You know, our vision is actually built around that, that we want to be a community of people that does life around the presence of God. That is our one pursuit because when we're in his presence, everything else changes. Everything else falls into place. We've been in a series uh, here the past few weeks. We've been calling it Jesus Stories. And we've been looking at the different miracles of Jesus. You know, Jesus did some incredible things when he walked this earth. He healed blind eyes. He raised people from the dead. He set the captive free from every demonic stronghold in people's life. We serve a God who is great, who is awesome, who is the same God today as he was yesterday in church. He will be that same God forever and ever and ever and ever. He is a miracle working God. And I have the incredible, the incredible privilege this morning to tell you about the greatest miracle of all this morning. The greatest miracle of all is Jesus conquering death, hell, in the grave for you and for me. And listen, there is nothing that we could ever do to deserve this, this great miracle of grace that God freely gives out to every single person. You see, I don't deserve it, you don't deserve it, but yet God sent his only son that whoever believe in him would not perish, but what? Have everlasting life. It is a free gift for us this morning. May we receive that free gift. Now, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Release everything you've done. Release any sin because I've, I've sinned, y'all. I've fallen short of the glory of God every single day, but yet God's grace is sufficient for me. It's sufficient for you this morning. And the power of the cross is more than enough. The resurrection power. You know, what's so incredible about this is this was prophesied by the, in the Old Testament that Jesus would do this. He would live the perfect life and he would go to a gruesome death on the cross and then he would conquer death on the grave for you and for me. But what happens in our lives when things that we hoped would happen doesn't turn out the way that we thought they might happen? And we feel overwhelmed with disappointment. We have this lack of hope. You know, my kids, uh, they get disappointed over things now that I am excited about in my own life. You know, my kids, they get disappointed when I tell them, hey, you got to go to bed right now. <laughs> for me, if someone tells me, Adam, you got to go to bed, I'm like, okay, praise Jesus, thank you, Lord. <laughs> that is for me. You know, they get disappointed when they can't have ice cream. Just these little things, right? They get disappointed if I tell them, okay, you can only watch 30 minutes of YouTube, and then you got to go outside and play. I got a little bit disappointed when my wife first pulled out this shirt and told me I had to wear it. <laughs> and then I realized, okay, it's not that bad looking shirt. I got a couple, got already a couple compliments today. If you've been married, or if you are married, you've had a wedding. And isn't it incredible that, man, wedding day, no matter how much planning goes into it, no matter how much thought goes into it, no matter how much money you pay, people to do something, inevitably something is going to go wrong and there's going to be some type of disappointment that happens on wedding day. For us, the, the service was absolutely amazing. My wife and I have been married now for 16 years and 16 wonderful, incredible years. And uh, on wedding day, it was magical. Like it just felt incredible. And then we got to the wedding reception and our DJ didn't have any of the songs that we requested. Not only did he not have all the songs we requested, he didn't have our first dance song. 
So we were into this band called Dashboard Confessional back 17, 16, 17 years ago, and uh, they were going to play this one song, and we were going to, this was like, this is the culmination of everything. Like, this is our first dance as husband and wife, and the guy doesn't have the song. We emailed him, we told him, we told him to him clearly, but he didn't have the song. So back then, it wasn't like you could hop on Spotify and find a song, right? Like you had to download it on the computer back then, or you had to have this thing called a CD, like that's actually coming out, you know? And so the DJ hands us a CD and says, hey, pick a song from the CD. And my wife looks at me, and I can see she has this disappointment all over her face. She says, Adam, you just pick one. <laughs> And so I look at the CD, I pick a song, and there's disappointment in that moment, right? We've all had disappointment in moments in life. We've all had things that we thought would happen, and they just didn't turn out the way that we thought. Things much more serious than just the DJ not picking the song, right? I want to tell you the story this morning of two men who had hope. And then suddenly, the light of their hope was snuffed out with the darkness of disappointment. They're walking along this road between Jerusalem and Emmaus, and they were bantering back and forth. They were so disappointed because Jesus, three days earlier, had died a gruesome death on the cross. You see, they thought that things were going to be different. You see, they, they heard stories about Jesus, maybe even witnessed Jesus performing miracles, healing the sick, healing blind eyes, raising the dead, setting the captive free, and they thought that Jesus had come in their realm and in the earth to bring them peace, prosperity, and freedom, and suddenly he dies. And they're wondering what went wrong, what happened, and they're incredibly disappointed with the outcome of what happened with Jesus. And then suddenly a stranger joins them on this road. And I want to read this story to you this morning. Let's read it together. It's found in Luke chapter 24. It says this, Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up. And walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? He says, what things? He asked about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people, the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped, say we had hoped, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more is the third day since all this took place, in addition, some of the women were amazed at us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But they did not see Jesus. Verse 25. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. What I want to do this morning is I want to give you three things that the resurrection does from this passage. Three things that the resurrection has done. Number one, because of the resurrection, we have rekindled hope. Church, because of the resurrection, we have rekindled hope. Verse 21. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. You have to get this picture of these men walking along this road. 
and what they had felt. They felt this disappointment. Scripture says that they had their head down. I can just imagine their, their shoulders are shrugged over. They're walking along this road, and they're just, you know, kicking rocks, wondering what went wrong. Why did Jesus allow this to happen to him? Why didn't he just send his angels and conquer the Roman Empire and set us all free? What happened? What went wrong? And they're in their emotions and they're feeling everything and they're just bantering back and forth and so disappointed with what occurred three days earlier. And Jesus, just imagine this, Jesus is walking alongside of them at this moment, but they don't know it's Jesus. They just see it as a stranger. You see, their disappointment held them back from realizing that Jesus was right there walking along with them. What disappointment in your life has held you back from seeing Jesus? What disappointment with church has held you back from seeing Jesus? What disappointment with someone who said they were a Christian but did something wrong to you and you felt something is holding you back on this Resurrection Sunday from seeing Jesus? What disappointment with life circumstances is holding you back from seeing Jesus? Maybe something incredibly went wrong and now you've been disappointed and you've lost hope. What thing is holding you back from seeing Jesus because they were so disappointed that they couldn't see Jesus who was walking with them? You see, religion will disappoint you every single time. Religion and playing church and going through the motions, it's going to disappoint you every single time. People will disappoint you every single time, including pastors, including myself. But Jesus, Jesus, he will never disappoint you. He is with you. And this is the most amazing thing, y'all, is Jesus is with you. Even when you don't know it, he's walking right there with you, right there beside you. Jesus is with you. You may not understand it. You may not realize it. In the middle of life circumstances that are so difficult and so hard, you might feel like you're lonely, but I'm here to tell you this morning, in Matthew it says, I am with you always. Jesus is with you through everything. What disappointment is holding you back through just really walking with the Lord and realizing he's with you? To have this relationship with him. You see, these men, they were disappointed. Verse 21 gives us the reason why they were disappointed. It says this, but we had hoped, say hoped. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. You see, the two men saw Jesus as a typical earthly king. An earthly king who would deliver earthly, tangible, temporal blessings. And they said there's no way this type of king would get himself crucified, they thought. They were disappointed by what transpired three days earlier. Have you ever been there before? Maybe it's a job situation. Maybe you lost your job or they've cut your pay in the middle of everything that's happening in this world right now. Maybe it's because of a marriage that didn't turn out the way that you thought that it would. Maybe it's a disappointment over a kid or a child who just not following the Lord or whatever else it might be. Maybe there's this disappointment within you. You see, when you become, hope is this incredible thing. When we, are, when we lose our hope, what do we do? We kind of draw back a little bit. But when we have hope, what happens? We have strength for tomorrow. We have strength for the next thing that's coming up. You see, there's a big, huge difference between worldly hope and biblical hope. Worldly hope, it's, it's a whim. It's by chance. It's, I hope this happens. It's, I hope I don't owe taxes this tax season. It's, man, I really hope that that business deal and that verbal agreement really follows through by that person. Man, I really hope that Trevor Lawrence brings the Super Bowl to the Jaguars this next year. It's hope, it's hope, it's hope. I think there might be a chance for that someday, someday in the future. Maybe not this year, but a few years after. I'm hoping this happens. 
But biblical hope is so much different. It's not a chance. It's not a gamble. It's not by a whim. Here's biblical hope. Hope is the confident expectation of something already done. Hope is the confident expectation of something already done. Watch what Jesus does with these guys as he had hoped, as these guys who had, who had, had lost hope. Verse, uh, verse 25, he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. He takes these hopeless disciples to the scriptures. Jesus tells them why he had to suffer, how it was prophesied in scripture that the Messiah would suffer in the Old Testament. Just imagine this. He starts all the way back in Genesis. And he explains everything moving forward how the prophets had prophesied that the Messiah would be coming to set all of the earth free. And he's walking them through, Jesus himself, walking on this road with these men who don't even know and recognize him, and he's explaining scripture to them. And he's explaining that this resurrection, that that Jesus who died and then rose again on the third day is the culmination of it all. It's the whole purpose. It's the cornerstone. You see, the cornerstone of the resurrection is everything. It's the, it's, 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 the, it's the reason for him coming and him giving his life. It's why we are here today. You see, because of the resurrection, your sins have been forgiven. Because of the resurrection, you have new life. Because of the resurrection, you are healed. Because of the resurrection, we have hope. It's because of the resurrection. And so as Jesus is walking with these two guys, there is rekindled hope. Not like the world. He takes them to the scripture. And if you believe this word to be true, it holds your hope. For you and for me, if we stand on the word, it will rekindle your hope. So number one, because of the resurrection, I have rekindled hope. Number two, this morning, because of the resurrection, we have renewed fellowship. Because of the resurrection, we have new renewed fellowship. Verse 28, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So we went to stay with him. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. So in keeping with ancient Middle Eastern rules of hospitality, these disciples, these men invite this stranger, Jesus, into their home. Jesus accepts their offer even though they don't recognize him. Jesus sits down with them and begins to fellowship with these two men over a mill. And this is the purpose of Christ on the cross. Because he so wants fellowship with us. You see, you have to go back. You have to go back to Genesis to understand all of this. You have to go back to the garden to understand this. Jesus walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the noonday. They had this fellowship. They had this relationship with God. And then because of their sin, it separated them from God. And so then a price had to be paid. And so a very privileged individuals on the Day of Atonement would go in and sacrifice an animal for the atonement of their sin, for the payment of sin. But then Jesus was sent to live this perfect life for the payment of our sin. Why? Because he wanted relationship with us. He wanted and desired relationship and is pursuing you, he's pursuing me. You see, no longer do we have to have a middleman to have relationship with God. But we, because of Jesus, because of the resurrection, now can have fellowship with him. 
You see, the cross allows us to be forgiven, but the resurrection allows us to have relationship with the loving Father. And because he was resurrection, now we can have fellowship with Jesus. And so Jesus, he was walking along this road. They don't even recognize him. And he's fellowshipping with them. He's breaking bread with them. And he's having this relationship with them. Which leads me to point number three. Number one, because of resurrection, I have rekindled hope. Number two, I have renewed fellowship. And number three this morning, because of the resurrection, we have restored focus. Because of the resurrection, we have restored focus. Verse 31, I love this. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. He disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us? While he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Verse 35, then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. You see, their grief over Jesus' death and temporary expectations blinded them from seeing Jesus. Their attention to their loss and sorrow prevented them from focusing on God. Luke doesn't explain why their eyes were open to see Jesus in this moment as he broke the bread. Perhaps it went back to they witnessed the feeding of the 5,000 as Jesus multiplied the bread and they remembered that. And all of a sudden, boom, oh, that's Jesus. I would submit to you this morning, though, that it's this reason. Because as Jesus broke the bread, they saw his hands. And in his hands, there were scars from the nails that were there just three days earlier. And so as Jesus broke the bread, and they saw the scars in his hands, the nail-pierced hands, all of a sudden, they recognized, a light bulb went off, and they said, this is Jesus we've been traveling with. This is the Son of God. He really is alive. And then all of a sudden, this is incredible, all of a sudden, Jesus disappears from their sight instantly. Can you imagine being there in that moment? One moment, Jesus is there breaking bread with you, and all of a sudden, he disappears and he's gone. Our God is amazing. And then these men, out of this newfound revelation of the love of Jesus and that everything was leading up from Genesis all the way to this point, this newfound revelation that, okay, he died, but now he's alive. And he's going to establish his kingdom one day. This revelation, they begin to run and they begin to shout, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. You see, Jesus was pursuing them for relationship with them. And all of a sudden, because they saw the scars in his hands, they begin to realize and understand, man, Jesus is alive. You see, their disappointment, you see, their disappointment of religion, their disappointment of what they thought should happen, their disappointment of what they thought should happen in religion and everything else of what they thought the kingdom should look like. That disappointment held them back from seeing Jesus as they walked on the road. What disappointment is holding you back from giving your entire life to Jesus? Release the disappointment. Release the hurt. Forgive and say, Lord, my life is your. Listen, religion is nothing. We're not about religion here. The spirit of religion has to go in our life. What we need and what we desire is only this authentic, real, true relationship. And because the stone has been rolled away, because Jesus has done that for us, this great miracle, we can have freedom and we can have life in Jesus. The stone has been rolled away. The tomb is empty. Why? Because he desires you. He wants relationship with you. May the nail-pierced hands be real to you today. 
He's done it. He's done it. Come on, our king has done it. He has done it. Would you rise with me? Come on, he's alive. He's risen. Our king is alive. He is risen. He's alive. We thank you, Jesus.